Welcome to the next video in our series building a profitable web design business. Today we're talking about marketing. Um, obviously there's a million ways to market your web design, web marketing business. There's so many different options out there. We are taking the 80-20 approach and we're looking specifically at how to reach out to your market. In other words, how to get as many of the right leads as possible with the minimum possible effort. So let's go. So in the previous video, we were looking at your positioning and we presented this idea that ideally what you should be doing is finding and selecting out of all the possible things that you could do a point. And that point is your particular niche. It's a particular type of service and position in the market that really only you can fill. It comes from your unique combination of experience and skills. And then that matches, it's designed to match perfectly a fine, small niche in your marketplace. There's no point all of us going out there saying, I am a generic web designer and going out for the generic web design market. There's already thousands and thousands and thousands of people doing that. The market is big enough for each of us to specialize in something that we enjoy doing, we're good at, where we speak the language and is also profitable. So when you've identified who you are and who you choose to be to the world and you've identified who your ideal market is, now it's time to go out and find those clients. So here's 8020 lead generation. Obviously at a high level, when we're talking about marketing, marketing is everything you do to match markets to offerings. And we're going to talk about the things that you offer and pricing and sales and all of that is can come under the umbrella of marketing. But today we're talking specifically about lead generation. And to break it down, what we're looking at is how to reach your target market, how to qualify them to get the right leads. And the word right there is extremely important. And also, you're going to need to educate your prospects. Sometimes somebody doesn't know that you are the perfect thing for them. So some transfer of information and knowledge may have to take place so that they realize that actually what you're offering is what they need. And we need to do all of that as efficiently as possible. Reach a target market, qualify them, and do some education as well. So let's look at the fundamentals of 80-20 lead generation. This is the most common mistake in lead generation. And we we'll call it like trawling the whole seabed. Sales and marketing can be compared to fishing in many ways. What we're talking about when you're selecting the right market, going directly for that right market and giving that market exactly what they want, that is like coming up with the perfect fly the perfect little bait to catch one specific type of fish in one specific area. The opposite of that is trawling the whole seabed where you spend a lot of energy dredging everything up so you end up with all of this crap that you get off the seabed which may include some of the things that you actually want, some of the high value clients are going to be pleasurable to work with and give you great case studies but you're also going to end up with a load more crap. And it's going to take you a lot of work to filter through all of that stuff to find what you really want. It's an inefficient process. So what we want to do is follow these steps. First of all, know exactly what you want. Picture your ideal prospect. Okay, that's a kind of visualization process. Who are they? What business are they in? What's their toner? What's their turnover? All of these questions. See if you can picture in your mind's eye the exact perfect business. You may even know a business like that. They may already be one of your clients. Then what we need to do is to go out and build a campaign and sales funnel just for them. Now this is one of the most fundamentally challenging things. We don't want to dredge up the whole seabed. So in order to prevent that, you've got to start perfecting the art of saying no. Saying no to everybody that doesn't match your ideal prospect. We positively do not want 
the wrong leads. We positively want to repel the people who aren't right for us. And sometimes I call this polarisation. When you are going out there into the world with the, the sure knowledge that you know what you are, what you offer, who you do it for, and what is so special about you, then two things will happen. You should positively attract those perfect clients. And by the same token, you should positively repel the people who are wrong. And they are both good things. You do not want emails or phone calls from people who aren't in your target market, right? who aren't in that little niche. These people that you can delight and who are going to be happy to pay a good rate for the results that you can deliver. We don't need any other type of prospect or any other type of client because they take up time in the sales process. It takes time to sell people. It takes time to do that education, to do that qualifying. So we want to do as little of it as possible. We want to spend more time actually delivering the services that we want to deliver and not talking to the wrong prospects. And then if somebody who is the wrong type of client, if they do get through the sales process and you take them on because you feel like you have to do it, they can also prove extremely costly. Because what you'll find is that somebody who doesn't want exactly what you're offering, they just want something generic or something slightly different, then that ma that makes you less valuable. And that is probably going to make you less respected. It's probably going to mean the client listens less, is inclined to listen less to you and give you less free reign. It's also going to mean that when you do exercise your best skills, it's some of it's going to miss the mark. So you're not going to end up with a great case study. And you're probably going to be paid less. So we, as we talked before in the previous video, when you get the exact right client, you get into a positive feedback loop where you exercise and develop your best skills with the exact right type of client. You generate more positive stories and success stories and case studies with exactly those right types of client. You learn how to deliver. You, you learn actually, first of all, exactly what goals they want and then how to deliver on those goals so that then you can go out to the market with this kind of blueprint template of the ideal client and say, bang, look what I've done for a business that's very similar to yours with very similar goals to yours. And you will find that it gets easier and easier to close those businesses, to charge appropriate fees and to get paid. And you can see the positive feedback loop. When you spread yourself out too thin, when you spread your energy too thin and your focus gets all blurred, then it's actually a negative feedback loop. You'll find it actually gets harder to attract clients when your portfolio is all over the place and your case studies are for, you know, 20 case studies for 20 completely different types of business that are unrelated to each other, that don't talk to each other, that aren't actually valid references for each other. And then even if you make a project work, like I say, the wrong type of client isn't going to make the ideal case study anyway. So step one, then picturing your ideal prospect. Obviously, what we want to do is to figure out exactly who the market is. Now, we started doing that in the previous video. Then once you've done that, which I'm assuming you have done, you want to work backwards from there. Marketing can go two ways. right? We're going back to the high level idea of marketing, which is to match products and services to a market that needs them, a market that has a problem or an opportunity. And you can do it two ways. You can say, right, here's a product or here's a service that I want to offer, and I'm going to go out and find a market for that. I'm going to find people who need that, see if people need it. Or you can say, where is there an unserved tribe out there? Where is there a group of people who congregate in some way and have a shared need or opportunity and then say how can I apply what I've got the resources that I've got to deliver and serve that opportunity it's generally the preferable way to find the market first and then fulfill the need rather than to create the product first and then try and find a market for it so that's what we're trying to do here we're looking for that ideal prospect particularly in cases where the client is absolutely the perfect ideal type of client, but they don't know, as I've said, that 
what you offer is exactly what they need. They may think they need something else just because they don't have the experience and the knowledge. So you have to bring them up to speed. Now, you want to do all of this, the outreach, the qualifying, and the education as efficiently as possible. That's how 8020 works. So here's the key to successful marketing. You need to make all your marketing activity both filtering and educating. And if you do that, then your all, all that marketing stuff that you put out there will be working while you sleep. So what do I mean by saying that your all your activity, all your material that you create must be both filtering and educating? Well, for one thing, if you are talking specifically to only one type of business or organization that has specific types of challenges and specific types of goals and you're speaking to those challenges and goals in everything that you put out there that will will be filtering automatically and as part of that message if you say this is what I do this is some experience that I've got from a project that I did this is how I work this is how I approach the problem these are the experiences that I have there will be a natural matching process which will either qualify in or qualify out at the same time all of that message all, all of those articles or posts or videos or whatever it is can also be educating the prospect because they come with a particular question in mind you then take that question and then lead them through a process and what you're doing in this process is you're educating them so that they then become slightly more sophisticated and they understand maybe what is really at the core of their problem what may be causing the problem and what they need you are also educating them in the way that you work the the fact that you exist the fact that you specialize in this area and the fact that you can get results Right, so we're filtering and we're educating just by publishing stuff out there. And we're not hard selling at this, at this point. This is marketing outreach only. So let's look at the types of things that you can do in your educating and filtering funnel. Now, here's the, the number one principle. Dry. You may have heard of, heard of this in if you've got any kind of programming background or development background. DRY stands for don't repeat yourself. What I mean by this is you never need to have the same conversation twice. If you find that you have got a generic portfolio on your website, you've got a generic contact form and you're in the generic web design market, you get certain types of businesses contacting you you may have phone calls with these businesses or even face-to-face -face meetings if you find that in many of those you are having the same conversations over and over again right then you are wasting time that is not 80 20 my friend if you're sitting down there saying this is how I work this is what's important this is what isn't important answering the same kind of questions over and over again there are better ways of doing it so let's look at just some of the places where you can publish material that is going to help you avoid having to have those same same kinds of conversations over and over again obviously blog posts is a nice quick cheap easy way to publish it's a very good idea you can publish a blog post every day if you want to YouTube videos can be amazing if you think somebody's got a particular question and you can get in front of a camera and explain to them the answer to that question as though you were sitting there in one of those meetings right record it on a YouTube video publish it with the title you know should you know local uh, small businesses in the whatever area be concerned with local SEO right so it's a specific answer to a specific question that people might be typing in YouTube by the way being the world's second busiest search engine Google YouTube and Facebook are the ones you need to be thinking about then if somebody goes on to Google and types in a question that's related to that then your video could come up and then they get a three minute or five minute face to face with you explaining 
not only that you have insight into their question, but they get a feel for you, they know you exist, all of these things that we've already mentioned, right? And it's in video form, which means they can sit back and be immersed in it. So what you can get from that is a really good emotional connection, as well as the fact that they know that there is a specialist out there who can help them with this kind of stuff. Plus it's generous, plus it gives them a, a nice warm feeling about you and builds trust. White papers are another great one. White papers have been around forever. Here is the guide to what you need to know about any particular area, right? Publish it in a white paper. It really doesn't take too long. Ask yourself, is there content that you write over and over and over again in emails and send them to prospects? Could you gather that knowledge together, put a white paper together on it, and stick it online? Case studies, also very similar. I'm actually going to speak about those directly in a bit. Case studies, very important. And as I said at the end of the last video, when you decide to enter and to dominate your particular niche, the first thing that you've got to do is get an outstanding kick-ass case study. Even if that means you throw extra days or your own money or whatever it is at your first good client, the one that perfectly matches the, the profile, you have to get a great case study because there's nothing like an ideal case study that says, hey, Mr. Business type of this is exact type, look at the results that I did for a very similar business who have very similar goals and very similar challenges to you and I beat it and I knocked it out of the park, right? The case study can be absolutely fantastic marketing. It just proves that you know what you need to do to get the exact kind of results for the exact type of client. I cannot say how important email follow-up sequences are. If you can get somebody to enter their email address, to go onto a mailing list, you can then drip feed them your thoughts, your whole positioning. You can tell them and remind them about your knowledge and your insight and your case studies and all of this stuff in their email inbox for as long as you need. Taking my list, for example, now it's not really targeted. It's just looking at the, the general web design audience, so it's not ideal. But my list, when people sign up to say, get 50 web design secrets free in your inbox, they don't get a PDF that this email straight to them that they save on their desktop and never read. What they get is two messages from me every week for six months. So they get one message every Tuesday, one message every Thursday. What that's doing is it's keeping me, my brand, at the forefront of their mind, of their consciousness. If they read it, it's a short message, it's got really good insight, and it's reminding them, here is somebody who has a particular angle on web design and making web design work, so that then if, they, if a point comes when they think, ah, oh, now I, I have this problem and I've got budget to solve it, who could solve that? Then hopefully that my brand has worked its way into their consciousness enough that they'll think that's the guy to do it. Email follow-up sequences are absolutely wonderful and they work while you sleep. Do not underestimate eBooks. I can't tell you what proportion of prospects that have come to my agencies since 2008 have read Save the Pixel, but it's well into double figures. Maybe one in four, maybe one in two people who have contacted me to say, can you do this work for me, have actually read one of my eBooks. It took me six months to write that book, but it has delivered a huge, huge value in saving me time in the sales process. It, it, the, the book actually brings people, brings prospects to my business. A similar thing has happened with Convert, my print book. So Real Dead Tree books are absolutely fantastic. I was talking to Perry Marshall about this. He said that his best clients are people that have read his books already. And the very best among them, right, 80-20 again, very best among them are people who have actually walked into a bookshop and picked up one of his books and taken it out. People who buy a book online are actually slightly less likely to read the book 
than people who go into a bookshop. So that's what he's found in his experience. I would also, if you're familiar with Dan Kennedy and any of his books, like the No BS Guides, Dan is an absolute master of marketing himself through books. I don't know how many books he's got out there on the market. There might be maybe 20 of these things, these No BS books. If you read those books, you are immersed in this impression of how smart uh, Dan Kennedy is, how valuable his time is, what a wonderful consultant he is. So if you need a consultant, you're going to think, oh, if I can afford Dan Kennedy, I'll hire him. Right. So those books are all out there in the market doing guerrilla marketing for Dan. They're out there selling for Dan. Right? If you want a book about price strategy, you get Dan's book on price strategy. You're not just getting Dan's book. You're getting Dan's information about price strategy plus this whole kind of sales pitch about what a, a valuable consultant Dan could be and how valuable he could be for your business. It's full of examples and case studies that are promoting the Dan Kennedy brand. And that is very, very smart. So that's just a few examples of how you can very cost effectively and time effectively, efficiently, put your message out into the market in a way that it's going to sit there as bait and potentially attract prospect after prospect after prospect and educate them and filter them. There are lots more besides. You can go onto Yahoo Answers and Quora. You can go onto LinkedIn. There's lots and lots of ways to publish, to comment, and to put your knowledge out there into the market. And I would say, do them all. But follow rule number one. Only get involved in conversations where your exact target market, who is either in a position right now that they have the need and the pain and the budget, or they're likely to be in the future, only speak to those guys. Do not waste your time. Uh, talking to other cockerels in the farmyard, right? You're only interested in the hens. I mentioned email lists and follow-up sequences. Extremely important. If you're going to have white papers, ebooks, anything out there, for goodness sake, get people onto your list. So one very, very common way is to give people freebies. So what does your ideal prospect want right now? What do they need right now? Give them some of that. Give them some of it for free in return for their email address. And you promise that you are not going to send them anything other than the information that, that they need, which is information about how to market their kind of business online. Right? That's exactly what they want. That's all you want to talk to them about anyway. So then what you do is you deliver targeted and valuable and helpful material all of which demonstrates the benefits that you uniquely deliver. So you're giving them exactly what they want and you're slipping in your brand into the process. This message has been brought to you by the guy that solves these type of problems all the time. Here's another little tip is to make your material kind of timeless, dateless. Right? Don't, don't put dates on it. Imagine that it could happen or present it in such a way that it could have happened on any day but present it as though it's news. And I see this happening quite a lot. So for example, your 15th follow-up message may be, I just wanted to tell you about this result that I was able to achieve recently with a, you know, Iowa farmer or, or whatever it is, whatever your target market is, and give them this bit of snippet of a mini case study. And now, they, it doesn't really matter to them whether it actually happened yesterday or last week or whether it happened in 2006. If the material is actually timeless, then it's going to be interesting to them. But, you know, present it as though it just happened. And, of course, the general thing, tell first. You've got to get the balance with telling and selling. It's something I've got wrong myself uh, enough in the past. Tell first, then sell. Right? Let them come to you. Attract them, draw them in. Don't go like a hunter in for the kill too early. We're actually thinking as farmers here, not hunters. So the goal is to build fans before customers. If you can make people fans of yours, then if they are actually a prospect and, and they're ready to buy, they're ready to, to make contact, they'll, they'll make contact. Build fans before customers. 
So we'll look at creating the funnel. Here's the exercise that you need to do. You need to get a book or several sheets of paper, spend some time writing down all the questions that your real ideal prospects are likely to be thinking about or even asking. They may be typing them into Google today. Something else you may find valuable is to follow any Quora boards that are on your specific topic area. Topic area. For example, there is a Quora board on there for law firm marketing that I found. So if that's your market and it's a good market to go for, law firms tend to have money, there, there's a board on Quora where people put up their questions about marketing law firms. So follow that. And what you're looking for is specific questions that people are asking that you may be able to go in and give a really authoritative answer about. And also you're looking for trends, ideally the beginnings of trends. So what you should try to do is to anticipate not what's big now, not what's really on everyone's lips now, but what is about to be big. If you can anticipate where and when the next wave is going to arrive, you can be ready for that wave. Much better than following along with a herd. If everyone's talking about social media marketing, right, it's already too late. If you can anticipate what it, people are going to be talking about in a few weeks' time, then you can score big. And what you then need to do is publish something expert on the subject and do it fast. So, for example... Facebook ads changes, there's a Google update, Google Plus comes out. What do all of these things mean to your specific market niche? So when anything new arrives, first thing you do is say, right, okay, how could this apply? How could this affect my niche, right? You need to ask that question before they even start thinking it. And then you need to get something out on that subject as fast as possible. Right? You don't have to predict the future. You don't have to have all the answers. But be the first to publish and be the first to get it out there. Because the minute people start typing that stuff into Google, if your case study, white paper, blog post or video is the number one thing that comes up, what's going to happen? Okay, What we find now is what I call the first out of the plane effect. Right, If you're skydiving, the first person to jump out of the plane is going to be uncatchable, right? Anyone else who jumps out the plane after that person can't catch that person up because they're accelerating away from them. So if you're the first person to publish and you're number one on Google, right, when people start typing in that question, you're going to get probably twice as many clicks as the article or piece that comes up at number two. That means twice as many people are going to read your post. And if it's good and it's generous and it's helpful and it's truthful and authoritative, that's going to get likes and tweets and links. And that is going to further secure your position at number one. And you will accelerate away from number two to the point that you have an unassailable lead. So let's talk quickly about case studies as well. Here's the plan, the blueprint for writing a case study. Now, generally, a case study is a quite factual, quite scientific description of the problem and how it was solved. So you start just by setting up the situation. XYZ Corporation wanted to, or had the challenge of expanding this and that, right? And this was the, the challenge. Describe what the problem was, okay? So they were finding that they needed to increase income, reduce costs, whatever it was. What were the implications of the problem? Which would mean, if things carried on as they were, what would it mean for the business? That then naturally points to a need. So they needed a way to... Dum, 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 dum. And that's called spin. That's the spin selling technique. Just describe the situation completely factually, completely straight. What is the problem in that situation? What are the implications of that problem? If the problem stays there, therefore, what is needed? Okay, and what you're then setting up is space for a solution. So you say what you did. You didn't say, I rode in on a white horse with trumpets blaring and solved it all for them with my brilliance. That's not what you do in a case study. You say, okay, 
what we did was we sat down and we spoke to the customers, uh, the, this business's customers. We realized that there was a blah, blah, blah. We did this. We tested a few ways. One of them worked very well. And here is the result. So what you're selling here isn't your natural brilliance. You're, you're not really blowing your own trumpet. What you're saying is, this is the way that we work. This is the process that we follow. And here's how we get the results that we do. So that anyone who has a similar comparable parallel problem will read this and go, I see this guy has solved that problem for that kind of company that's very much like my com company. I think it would be a good idea to see if this guy can solve my problem as well. And then the last thing you put in the case study is the lessons learned. Okay, what are the insights that we've got? So when people read this, they'll think this is an intelligent and also generous and sharing expert in this area. Right? This isn't trumpet blowing, as we said. And for a title, you can, you know, this is just one example. You can simply title a case study how one particular type of business in a particular area, okay, so the exact business type that is your target market, and then you say the type of goal that they achieved, right? So how some of them doubled their income or slashed their costs or whatever it is, yeah, increased their exposure in the local market, whatever it is, and just say how one exact business type achieved this exact particular type of goal. And then that will then worm its way right into the minds of other business types like that, i.e. your ideal type of market, who has the same kind of goal or problem, right? Job's done. So let's think about qualifying prospects. Obviously, qualifying is a process that you must go through in order to discern whether a prospect is appropriate for you or inappropriate for you. So, if your marketing material is good, if you have followed the advice that I've given you, then this material should already have started that process of filtering out the wrong prospects. It should literally, they might, they may go, oh, this is interesting, but, you know, we're clearly not this type of business for this guy. And it should also start making the right types of prospect interested in you. So there's two things that you want to be doing. That's your sales funnel. You want to qualify in as many as of the, the right, apparently right type of prospect as you can by putting your message out there, by you know not having the same conversation twice. If you've got an insight about the market, then get it out there. Get it out there as a video or a blog post or an ebook or a real book or whatever it is you have to do. By the way, one other comment on books, Kindle books can be really, really good. You publish Kindle books, you can publish them for... 99 cents or you can put them out there for free very very cheap way compared to creating a print book of getting your message out there and making you a published author as well so you want to reach as many people as possible get them into the funnel and then the funnel's job is to qualify out as many as possible and i can't stress this enough you don't want the wrong types of prospect now you want to qualify out those wrong prospects as quickly and as early as you can but the important thing is as automatically as you can as well you don't want to be turning up for a face-to-face -face sales meeting with a wrong prospect so let's look at a few tactics or tools that you could use to qualify prospects in and out one is simply an online questionnaire now, one really good example is is fbforme.com, which is Perry Marshall's one that he created that goes alongside with his uh, Facebook Ultimate Guide to Facebook Advertising book. And that is like a 10 question uh, questionnaire that you can fill in and it will say, yes, you should be advertising on Facebook or no, you shouldn't. Right. What is that? It's, it's very helpful, very generous, but it's also qualifying people qualifying them as to should you be buying the book and if you should be buying the book maybe you should be also buying a course from Perry on Facebook advertising or a seminar from Perry on Facebook advertising or some consulting from Perry so it's doing a great job of just taking an axe to the
the whole potential market and saying, okay, well, these guys clearly aren't going to buy anything more valuable from us. But, you know, at the same time as calling, qualifying people out, you're qualifying people in. So all online questionnaires are great. Make it simple, make it quick. A similar tactic to that is simply to put a checklist on your website. So just say, you know, literally as upfront as this, you could say, am I the web marketer or designer or consultant for you? Am I the right person for you? Here are six questions to answer, right? Put those questions down there. Tell them the things where, you know, if you are shopping on price, whatever, then I'm not the person for you. If you are this, um, some of our members have even put, here are six or seven reasons not to hire me, right? Don't hire me if, don't hire, hire me if, don't hire me if, right? That is a bold and original creative way to say to people, if you're not in my target market, you can go away. So, you know, what we're saying is get out there and don't be afraid to qualify because as much as you qualify out by the same measure, you will be qualifying in the right people and making them interested. You could put quite a prescriptive contact form on your site. This isn't something that I would necessarily recommend. It will tend to reduce sign-up rates, the uh, actual conversion rates of a form. However, if by doing that you improve the quality of the leads that come through, it may help. So what I mean is to say, you know, you might say, okay, what size is your business? How many employees do you have? What's your turnover? This, that, and the other, right? Or you might just put a form that says, tell me what you want to achieve and then in the second thing, how may I contact you, right? Try try both ways, but what you don't really want to be doing as much is using the phone, um, phone meetings, certainly face-to-face -face meetings to qualify. Phone calls, probably too late, but if people have got through the process to a certain level, it's okay to spend 20 minutes on the phone with them. Because following the 80-20 rule, some of that work on the phone, qualifying a, a relatively well-qualified prospect already, right? Using that discernment, asking those right questions on in a phone call could actually be some of the best time that you spend. It could save you from inadvertently starting to work for the wrong type of client who isn't going to help you in the long term. So here's my tip when you are actually having a conversation by phone or by email. Focus your questions primarily around success, success for the client. What do they perceive success as? Okay, so one question that I use quite often is, six months down the line, 12 months down the line, we're enjoying a beer together and you say, I am so glad that we did this prospect. It was a clear success because, and then what is the exact thing that constitutes success, right? Is it that we got an extra 100 signups or we increased our turnover by 40k in the quarter or you know would 30k be success would 20 what about 35 yeah so it's really about getting a client to focus their mind on what success looks like and when you know what success looks like to them you then know if that's something that you are best placed to deliver right if you get a client who says I just want our website to be nicer. I don't know what I want it to look like, but I'll know it when I see it, right? Run away as quickly as you can. We've all worked, lots of us have worked for clients like that, for pros uh, projects like that. And when there's no actual recorded goal other than something that's completely subjective and in the client's mind, how are you supposed to know whether you can deliver on that goal? or how long it's going to take, or how much time and if you're going to have to invest in that. So what's the cost going to be to you? Now, you want clients who know what their goals are and where you know that you have a method that can deliver on those goals. Now, later on in the process, in a later video, when we talk about contracts, your contracts are actually going to reinforce these policies. So you're going to be clear throughout this whole qualifying process, throughout the funnel, you are going to be educating your clients that here's the way that you work. Here's what you do. Here's what you don't do. Here are the kind of promises that you will make if you work with them. Here is what you expect from them if you work with them. 
right? And make it clear to them that if they become your client, if you take them on, then your contracts will actually have all this in place. This is my promise to you. This is the investment I need from you, right? This is what you have to put in. This is how you're going to have skin in the game. But we'll cover all of that in a later video. It's worth quickly just mentioning pay-per-click. Obviously, there's loads and loads of marketing channels out there. Organic SEO can be good. And we've talked about that and that really the key to that, the holy grail of that, being anticipating a question that's going to apply to your market just before the market starts asking it and before anyone else answers it, right? Pay-per-click can be really, really good. And it can be very cost-effective when the conditions are right. Right? Pay-per-click is never the right answer you know, for, for everybody in every situation. Only when the conditions are right. So Google AdWords can be fantastic, but this tends to be better when your market is conscious of their need. Right. So when they know if you if your kitchen is flooding and you need a plumber, you're not going to go onto Facebook. Right. Or eBay or something like that or Amazon to find a plumber. You're going to go on Google. I need a plumber now in my local area. Right. So when people have a need, they're in buying mode. Right. It's urgent. Then AdWords can really, really help if you can offer something that matches their need. Right. Then you want to be trying to, this this should be a hot lead, you should be trying to close these people soon. Not, you know, so send them through to a page that says, that sells. A page that says, this is what I do, these are the results that I get, this is why you should contact me right now, and this is how responsive I will be. However, on the other hand, when you've got people who are maybe not conscious of an urgent need right now, but who could be this is this is your second side of the market right maybe facebook pay-per-click can be a better way to reach them with facebook pay-per-click that will let you identify people in a particular area maybe even particular uh, people who are you know you can filter on age gender kids relationship status job title and interests so what facebook will let you do is to put out ads to say this is to all uh, finance directors in the greater whatever area right and and talk to a a a problem or a challenge or something that's going to be interesting to them because when people are on facebook they're not there to solve a problem they're they there to kill some time they're there to socialize and to mix and to be open to new ideas and be entertained so facebook ads that work will you know not be directly trying to solve a problem you might be kind of sowing the seed of a problem or sowing the seed of an opportunity in somebody's mind but generally i would say that if you can then put people into a bit of a, a longer term sales funnel to say uh, here's a white paper that that could be interesting to you right here's a new opportunity here's a new way of thinking about this right get them get them interested they're in browsing mode they're in interesting mode so to take them through to something and then get them onto your list and then drip feed them your sales process either way what you've got to got to got to do with pay-per-click as much as you can is track your cost per lead find out how much it costs you to get an exact lead you should also know then what your lead to customer conversion rate is eventually and what your typical value the profit that you earn from a customer is customer is worth so if it's going to cost you sixty dollars to get a lead through adwords or through uh, facebook is that going to be profitable for you right that's basic marketing so here's another different area this is quite advanced now but can be very cost effective these are you know, some of the things that may not spring to mind straight away but let me give you an idea getting other people to market you for you can be easier and more cost effective than doing the work yourself this is 80 20 so ask yourself this who has the ear of your target market in other words who do, does this community this tribe that you're trying to market to in this niche who do they listen to right where do they congregate is another important question so you might think um, 
business coaches, right? Do they hire business coaches? Accountants, they probably hire accountants. Do they hire the same kinds of accountants, right? If it's in a local area, speak to the accountant in the town or a few accountants in that town. What about professional groups or social groups or sporting or religious groups, right? Do people congregate there and do you have a route to speak to them or have somebody advise to them in that context? What about things like printers, right? Printers provide marketing type services to businesses. You may be able to get in with a printer and the printer will recommend you to any client who comes in saying, you don't know where I can get a website or whatever. In return, you can then promote the printer to any clients that you have in the local area who need print services, right? Or you can give out their vouchers and they can give out your vouchers. Taking it that to on, on a tangent, what about other web marketers who don't compete directly with you? So if you're a web designer, are there pay-per-click consultants in your area or SEO people in your area? If you're a pay-per-click person, what about web designers in your area? That you can get together, you can see if you've got some synergy, and you can pass clients to each other. Right? Promote each other, rope up. You will both scale the mountain more safely and more effectively if you rope together. I would generally suggest you offer a finder's fee. Any client that you recommend that becomes a client, I will happily pay you 20% of any fees that I get from that client for the duration, the lifetime of that relationship. That's an incentive. Or you may just say, look, I will feed you all the leads that I can give you. Here's another idea. If you're talking to an organization, maybe a club or a professional organization, who, you know, the, where, where your ideal target market is actually the membership of that organization, you might do this. You might say to the organization generally, if you, you do web design or you do conversion improvement or you do SEO or you do AdWords, right? Go to them and say, if I can improve your marketing by this, that, and the other, I'll do it for free, okay? Will you promote me? Right? I will manage this for you. If I get this kind of results, would you return the favor by doing a case study and promoting me to your membership? So you're actually giving them something. You might be giving them something for free. That could be the best time you ever spend thinking 80-20. Right? Give it a couple of weeks. You could have all the clients you need in return for a couple of weeks. Doesn't that sound more appealing than cold calling out of the phone book? So let's just summarize what we've covered today. You want to be a farmer, not a hunter, when it comes to leads. Hunter has to go out there, make a kill, drag it back, you know, get the money, then go out again and hunt. What you want to create, you want to, instead of going out doing that solitary hunting, you want to be in the business of creating and building a funnel that is automatically going to bring you leads while you sleep. You mustn't repeat yourself. If you find that you are having the same conversation multiple times in whatever format, maybe phone, maybe email, maybe face to face, get that information down in a video, in a blog post, in a book, whatever it is, and get it out there into the market. Because if you're having to have that conversation more than once, it means that there are a lot more people out there who need to have that conversation. So do it in an automated way. Create great content all of which educates and qualifies for you. And that implies speaking to your perfect, ideal target prospect all the time. Get as many people as possible into the top of your funnel and then qualify as many as possible out as automatically as possible. And of course, always market to your ideal client and ignore the rest. So that's all my tips for generating leads to market your professional web business. I appreciate that it takes courage to focus your uh, marketing in terms of your brand and to focus your marketing activity in terms of writing only stuff, creating only stuff for this ideal client. But take my word for it. If you do it, then you should maximize your chances of getting into that positive feedback loop. 
where you could actually have better and better clients, leads coming in, more leads coming in than you can actually handle, so that all you need to do is just qualify and cherry pick the very best clients. And that is the way to build up your profits and to grow your business over time.